We have a few people with us. Two more coming. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Well, good. Um, welcome to our last of the three spring talks. Because of COVID, Ron Butler is going to give his talk by Zoom. As you can see, he's got that ready to go. Um, and I thank you all for coming out to hear that. We do have, we are working on talks for the fall. And some of the things we're thinking about is getting Mark Porcris back to talk about loons, give us an update on that. Um, also interested in lichens. I don't know how many of you find lichens intriguing, but we're thinking that might be kind of fun and maybe lichens mosses. And also having St Sally Stockwell come up and talk about where our birds winter, where they migrate to during the winter months. So those are the things we're looking at right now. Um, Dr. Butler is a uh, professor emeritus from UMF. He's done a lot of things in the natural world. I guess that's the best way to put it. A lot of uh, citizen science projects, which some of you may have been involved with, with butterflies and other critters. Um, currently working on a book of butterfly identification, I believe. Uh, we thought that damselflies and dragonflies were not things that people often talked about, and it would be fun to really learn something about them. And Ron has agreed to do that for us. So without further ado, Ron, take it away. Oh, one other thing at the end, if you have questions, what I'll do is come back up and um, take questions from the floor and then relay them to Ron. Okay. Sounds good. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I don't know if you can see my face or not, but. Yeah, you're up there in the corner. Can Alrighty. We... So um, I began my journey in biology actually studying mammals. I worked with deer and Canadian beavers and wild uh, mice and then switched my focus to seabirds. And I spent a couple of decades working on seabirds, including two trips to Antarctica and several summers spent in Newfoundland. And it wasn't really until the mid nineties that I switched my focus to insects. And for the past two and a half decades, I've basically um, helped coordinate several long-term statewide citizen science initiatives dealing with important insect groups. The first of those was the Maine Damselfly and Dragonfly Survey that was followed, of course, by the Maine Butterfly Survey. And then uh, finally, the uh, Maine Bumblebee Atlas, which just uh, finished up a couple of years ago. We have um, finished a book describing um, the Butterfly Project, both in Maine and the Canadian Maritimes, and that's at the publishers now and should be out next year. Um, we're presently working on one similar to that on damselflies and dragonflies. And we're still awaiting the final uh, tallies of the bumblebee survey before we get started uh, with compiling all that information that some of you probably helped collect. But tonight, our topic is dragonflies and damselflies, the Odonata. This is a group that's near and dear to my heart, probably my favorite group to work with. And we can find um, lots of historical references to dragonflies. People have been attracted to them in one fashion or another um, for centuries, literally. And so one of the earliest um, references I can find to uh, dragonflies is their appearance on a um, late Bronze Age 
about 15,000 years before the Christian era um, on a stone seal. Something would be pressed into uh, clay. And so, so something of this nature with a dragonfly emblem on it. In uh, the Japanese culture, there are lots of historical references to um, dragonflies in terms of haiku and other kinds of writings. And they were very popular in terms of family crests. So for example, this is a tsuba, the kind of the guard on a katana. Um, and you see the dragonfly emblem here. And again, on this uh, medieval uh, samurai, the dragonfly crest prominently uh, displayed. And in Europe, we find really early uh, references in, in the literature to dragonflies. If we look across the uh, various nations of the world and, and see how they refer to dragonflies in, in, in a, a, a common name sense, we find all sorts of interesting descriptors for this particular group of organisms. And many of them are mm, sort of negative in their connotations. Devil's needle, eye stinger, eye stitcher, uh, water dipper, horse stinger. Um, I know I grew up uh, with my grandmother teaching me that they were all darny needles. So that was how I referred to them as a, as a uh, youngster growing up near the water. In terms of cultural perspectives, it really varies. So in Italy, uh, Dragonflies often had the, the uh, reputation of being Satan's familiars, having been sent from hell. In Sweden, they were referred to as the devil's steel yard. That actually doesn't refer to a place where you make steel, it refers to something you measure steel with. So if a dragonfly was flying around your head, it was weighing your soul and finding you wanting. I grew up, with my grandmother telling me that darny needles would stitch the lips together of any little boys who told lies. It took me many years to outgrow that one. Other cultures have different perspectives on the Odinata. So I showed you the, the uh, use of the crest uh, in Japanese culture, and, but also there was a, an association with um, dragonflies being the harbinger of a good rice harvest. If we look at some indigenous peoples, uh, they often um, associate spiritualistic traits to Odinata. So the Dakota, uh, believe they were witches and animals, considered them a symbol of water purity. And this is a uh, Navajo sand painting of a dragonfly. The Tsuni, again, accorded them supernatural powers. And on Tahiti, um, dragonflies were uh, seen as the familiars of Hero, the god of thieves. So I guess the, the folklore was dragonflies would often buzz around your head uh, to distract you while your house was actually being robbed. In terms of dragonflies in society, in a number of cultures, people eat them. Usually not the adults, it's usually the larvae that are eaten. And there are a variety of recipes in case you decide you want to try, try that. In other cultures, they have purported medicinal properties. Headaches, indigestion, fever. Um, I believe in Madagascar, the remedy for a headache is to catch a dragonfly and put it under your hat. And finally, decoration. A number of indigenous peoples, including the Kofan of Colombia, use those dragonflies that have colored wings. The wings are often uh, made into pins or other kinds of ornamentation. And of course, that same fascination with dragonflies and use of ornamentation uh, carries over into contemporary society. 
So I, I'm sure you've seen many, many kinds of uses of dragonflies in terms of names of boats and names of bars and name, uh, all sorts of jewelry. Um, and of course, the inevitable tattoos and coffee cup. If I get one more dragonfly coffee cup from my relatives, I will be able to open up my own store, I think. Well, if we look at insects and try to fathom the place of dragonflies in that big picture, what we find is um, insects and, as it turns out, mayflies diverged very early from the main line of insect evolution. And so these groups broke off very early, continuing on into present times. So there's a very ancient group of insects compared to some of our more um, numerous insects on the planet. The critter that is often um, represented as one of the first dragonflies is this critter. It's actually not a dragonfly. It's what we call a griffin fly. It belongs to the order Meganosoptera. This is not a, a not the Odonata. Okay, those are the damselflies and dragonflies. This was kind of an evolutionary side branch, but clearly very similar in terms of its appearance, its external morphology to dragonflies of today. The difference, of course, was its size. It was enormous. These griffin flies flew at a time uh, in the Earth's history when the oxygen concentration of the atmosphere was much higher and would support the kind of uh, tracheal respiratory system that all insects possess um, at that time and allow them to approach these enormous sizes. Presently, the oxygen concentration of our atmosphere is lower and this size of an insect is not possible with that kind of respiratory system. It just doesn't supply the tissues rap rapidly enough uh, with oxygen at that kind of a body size. So it's, a, it's a pretty impressive bug. So they were flying in the upper Carboniferous 325 million years ago or so. Note, before the dinosaurs. The first real dragonflies appearance in the book 25 million years later, roughly about 300 million years ago. So this particular fossil, it's really nice. And by the way, dragonflies don't fossilize very well, uh, in part because apparently with those wings, they float. And that gives predators time to pull the carcasses apart or have them degrade before they make a nice fossil imprint like the one you have on the screen. But what you can see in this 300 million year old fossil is the resemblance to a contemporary species, uh, family Gumphidae, commonly called the club tails. And again, if we look at some fossil dragonfly wings, look at the artist's representation of what the fossil looks like, and then compare that to a contemporary dragonfly wing, the similarities are pretty pronounced. In fact, you can find some of the same veins in both the fossil forms as well as the contemporary form. A little more recently, um, we find, you know, 125 million years ago, 25 million year, years ago in, in um, amber, uh, damselflies and dragonflies that are almost identical to contemporary species. They're not the same species, but they're just really similar. Uh, this is a, a spread wing, and you could not really discriminate that animal from the spread wings that fly around in Maine during the summertime. So again, a really ancient group of insects. So uh, presently in this order of insects, and Odonata refers to tooth, having to do with the impressive uh, tooth-like projections on the jaw-like uh, mandibles of dragonflies and dragonflies. There are about 63, 6,400 species. And I say about because um, new species are discovered uh, 
primarily in Asia on an annual basis. So we always keep adding a few more. Now, these are not evolving. It's people just didn't realize we had them. They're roughly divided into two suborders, roughly equally. The dragonflies proper, the Anisoptera, and the damselflies, the Zygoptera. So I sometimes get asked if the damselflies aren't just baby dragonflies. And of course, that's not the case with all adult insects. They're as big as they're ever going to get when they finally emerge from the pupil casing or the last uh, end star of development. So they don't actually get larger after that. There is one other small group in the three species that sometimes in literature is represented as a, a distinct suborder and other times as kind of a in the Anisoptera, the dragonflies. So you may see a reference to that uh, on occasion, the um, Anisozygoptera. Okay, and again, this is three species. Uh, one of them may now be extinct. Very small group. Sort of has characteristics of both damselflies and dragonflies. So, and taxonomically, it's it's kind of still whether it's a distinct suborder or not. So, we'll start seeing the first dragonflies any day now, um, and it's always. Uh, good to know how to distinguish between the two suborders. And so one easy way to do it is based on size. So generally, most damselflies are small with relatively thin abdomens compared to much larger dragonflies. Now, there are some exceptions to this, and I'll talk about that. The wings of dragonflies and damselflies are fundamentally different. Dragonfly wings are asymmetric. You can see this really clearly here, with the fore wings being longer and narrower, and the hind wings being shorter and wider. Damselflies, on the other hand, have four wings that are basically the same shape. You can see that maybe you can't. But all four wings are to get folded together here. Okay. So wing shape is one, one characteristic that works for quite well. A real easy one is how they hold their wings. Dragonflies cannot fold their wings. Okay. So once the dragonfly emerges and hardens off, the wings basically stay out extended when at rest. While damselflies can actually fold their wings and generally do when they're perched over their abdomens. And this has to do with the way the wing articulates with the thorax and the angle of the thoracic segments. But um, when we look at dragonfly wings, we see that they're fairly broad across the joints that articulate with the thorax. While in damselfly wings, there's a petiole or neck. They come together in a very small area relative to the width of the wing. And that's not readily apparent when you look at them perched, but the fact that the wings are folded is related to that kind of wing structure. Dragonflies proportionally have larger eyes relative to the size of the head. In fact, dragonfly eyes are proportionally the largest eyes in the insect uh, class. So by contrast, this is the head of the damselfly. You can see the eyes are large, but not anywhere near as large as the uh, dragonfly is proportional to the head. So those characteristics should allow you to separate pretty easily damselflies from dragonflies. All of the Odonata have a very complex life cycle. Virtually all of them, few exceptions, have an aquatic larval form. And in fact, most of the lifespan of any damselfly or dragonfly is spent as an aquatic larva. So we technically call these larvae. However, in the older literature, they're also referred to as nymphs and sometimes naiads. 
but most of the literature refers to these now as um, as larvae. The larvae are pretty easy to discriminate to family based on their general appearance. So here are the families that we have in Maine, and you can see that each of them is pretty distinctive. Now, getting to species is a different story, but getting to family is pretty easy. Similarly, similarly in the three damselfly families we have, the larvae are quite distinct family-wise. Not so much when you try to do go to species. The larvae of all odonates are generalist predators. And all of them have this really cool, almost out of the movie aliens kind of mouth part as larvae that effectively looks like this. Okay, so the actual jaws of the animal are up here. The Okay, and so while your jaws work like this, remember insect jaws work like this. Underneath the head and the beginning of the thorax is this articulating, what for better term, we'll call a lower lip, the labia. And this thing kept hinged and underneath can shoot out in the length of the larva and grab prey items as this hapless young minnow has just found out. So these guys are capable of actually their head actually is using this really remarkable appendage. Now this is lost in the adults. The adults don't have this. This is only the larval form. So again, most of the life cycle of any given species is spent as an aquatic organism and they go through multiple molts differs depending upon the species on average probably about 12 growth molts uh, so these insects are not truly metabolists like for example butterflies they're what we call hemi metabolists because with each growth molt they begin to change subtly until they reach their final larval stage and that's the larval stage which will crawl out of the water and allow the terrestrial adult to emerge and here's a sequence um, a uh, libellulate a glider doing exactly that the animal crawls up and firmly attaches itself to the substrate now different species have different lengths legs Longer legged species tend to move farther from the water. Short legged species sometimes just climb just barely out of the water. The larval casing ruptures down the dorsal part of the thorax, and the immature terrestrial adult emerges, does a handspring, and re grasps its larval exoskeleton. And it's going to hold on to that to anchor itself as it begins to pump body fluids into its abdomen and into its wings to get them to spread out, eventually get into flight position before the animal is able to fly away. And this can take varying amounts of time from a few hours to most of a day, in part depending upon the species, but also depending on how humid it is, how dry it is, whether it's windy and so forth. What's left over is this thing, the last exoskeleton of the last larval stage, or what we call NSTAR. And this is referred to as an exuvia. Sometimes people call them skins, sometimes husks. Um, that's actually an exoskeleton. But this is, this is what the, the adult was wearing underwater for its last uh, larval development stage. The bodies of all insects uh, are basically composed of three major sections, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And damselflies and dragonflies are no exception. Head is easily recognized. The abdomen starts here and has 10 sections. So this is all abdomen. And the thorax is this part. 
And again, in insects, the thorax is kind of the locomotor unit. The legs and the wings, if the insect has them, and most insects do, will be attached to the thorax. The vision of damselflies and dragonflies is really quite remarkable. Dragonflies have on average 25 to 30,000 individual, what we call omatidia, uh, kind of visual subunits that make up these compound eyes. And you kind of see in this lower one, those individual subunits. Those the individual subunits have all basically all the same components as your eye. And each of them is wired together to the central nervous system. So those kinds of eyes allow dragonflies um, to be the terrific predators that they are as adults because they have excellent visual acuity. Moreover, they can see visible light like we can, but they can also see polarized light and ultraviolet light. And, and the eye, um, and it, it shows in this particular critter, not so well in this one, um, is made up of those subunits, but the subunits aren't all the same. Some of them differ structurally in terms of the pigments they contain from the rest of them. And those are concentrated in the upper surface of the eye, and that's what we call the fovea. And you can actually see here that the omatidia in the fovea look different than the omatidia in the lower eye. And the structural differences, and probably the neurological differences, and the pigment differences in those units give the dragonfly excellent, excellent visual contrast and are essential in terms of how dragonflies hunt because they do something pretty remarkable. Sometimes you read popular literature and uh, dragonflies are described as pursuit aerial predators. And that's technically incorrect. They are actually interceptor aerial predators. Really neat study by Lin et al. actually analyzed what goes on when dragonflies see a prey item. And what happens, happens in milliseconds. Guys have had 300 million years of evolution to perfect the system. So these guys are able to see and recognize a potential prey item, track it, decide whether they're going to take off, Dis track the animals that's flying overhead. Again, this is probably mostly the fovea, the upper part of the eyes is tracking this, and then not launch themselves at the bug but launch themselves to where the bug is going to be. They intercept it rather than chase it. And what that means in terms of dragonflies is their efficiency at, as predators is pretty astounding. I just, I just hunted up some various uh, predator success ratios of the things we typically think of as big time predators like the big cats and so forth. And you can see some of them are pretty low, tigers 5%. Wolves, 14%. Lions, depending on whether they're group hunting or not, 17, 25%. Uh, your cat, 32%, a good reason if you've got cats, as I do, to keep them inside because they kill lots of things that they don't need to. Peregrine falcons, probably up there, 47%. They all pale in comparison to dragonflies, which have a 95% success rate. Again, 300 million years of evolution. Uh, like all insects, except flies and the twisted wing parasites that have wings, dragonflies have four wings. And we've already seen that in terms of our comparison of damselfly and dragonfly wings. Um, the wings move independently. In fact, um, mayflies and dragonflies are often described as having a primitive form of flight. It's called direct flight musculature. So they're actually being pulled up and down by muscle attachments. That's not the way most um, quote unquote modern, wing, uh, modern insects fly. 
Um, those independently moving primitive wings are highly maneuverable and allow dragonflies to pull off something that many insects can't. And that is they can hover, they can fly forward, they can fly sideways, they can fly even backwards. And that's pretty cool. I often see on Wikipedia and places like that, that dragonflies fly at 50 miles an hour. Uh, none of the studies that I have seen bring them anywhere close to that. Fast flying dragonflies, maybe 25 to 35 miles an hour, uh, which is still pretty fast for an insect that size. Uh, damselflies tend not to approach those speeds. They're often de described as being weaker flyers. I'm not sure what that means. They're slower flyers, certainly. And they don't tend to fly in long, straight uh, lines, unlike uh, dragonflies. Uh, but, but they certainly are capable of the same maneuverability. We think of insect migrants, and immediately we think of monarch butterflies, as well we should. But as it turns out, lots of dragonflies are migrants, too. Uh, 16 species at least uh, in North America are migrant uh, dragonflies. In fact, some of the first dragonflies we'll see uh, this week down where you folks are um, didn't emerge here. They've come from farther south. And so the common green darter is one great example of these uh, migrants. And like monarchs, these are generational migrations. A single animal does not migrate south and then migrate all the way back north again. It's done in generations. Okay, So we have some generations that breed in one location and then move. We have others that breed in a southern location and then stay there. And then we have another generation that emerges from the southern extremes of the range. And that's the uh, generation that moves back north. And again, there are 15 other species besides this one that have a similar kind of migration pattern. The record holder, um, you know, I think about birds, for example, I think about the Arctic tern. It's just this wonderful migration from the Arctic to Antarctica and back again. It's like 25,000 miles a year. Um, it's the wandering glider, Pantella flavescens. And this little dragonfly is sometimes found thousands of miles out to sea on ships, right? Where it comes the only uh, one that I know of that does kind of a transcontinental generational migration. So um, these guys, uh, as individuals, don't make the whole thing. It's done in generations. But individuals that have been tagged have flown as far as 3,700 miles. Again, we're talking about a critter about this big. That's pretty remarkable. Sex differences. There are males and females, dragonflies and damselflies. How do you tell the difference? Well, um, the easy way with dragonflies is to look at the body shape. Uh, males will have a little structure right here. And that little structure is the secondary sex apparatus. The primary sex apparatus is back here. Females lack that. Female abdomens tend to be thicker and that tends to hold true most of the way along the abdomen compared to males. There are some other um, ways to tell if you've got them in hand, Males will have three structures on the tail end. Females will only have two that are really prominent. Um, sometimes the color pattern is different. Sometimes it's not. It depends on the species. So these two are pretty similar. The abdominal pattern differs a little bit, but the thoracic pattern is pretty much the same. In other species, there are distinct color differences between the sexes. So this is one of our most common damselflies, or the Eastern Forktail. This is the typical male coloration. This is an immature female, and this is a mature female. Right, so those are very distinctive 
very easy to separate sexes based solely on coloration. In terms of reproduction, uh, damselflies and dragonflies share in common the fact that the male has special terminal, for lack of a better term, claspers at the end of its abdomen that it grabs on to females with um, just behind the head in dragonflies or just behind the first part of the thorax in damselflies. Now they're not copulating, right? The male has just grabbed the female. In damselflies, these claspers, and they have actually technical names we can talk about, you know, uh, paraprox and epiprox and, and, and uh, CT and Siri and so forth. But um, you can think of this sort of as a key. And you can think of this part of the thorax, this is a, a scanning micrograph of a female, this is the first part of the thorax, this is the second part. And you can see this structure here, okay? You can think of that as the lock. The male has to have the right key to fit the species-specific female lock. And the only one on this will fit this particular lock is this guy. None of these other keys will fit this formation. And so they won't be able to, to grasp on effectively. By the way, the structure of these species-specific terminal claspers is how you can identify the, uh, these guys to species pretty easily if you've got a simple little hand lens. Actual copulation involves the cooperation of the female. So if the male grab, and the male's always going to be in front, right? And he's always in the head. Uh, but the female actually has to bring her reproductive structures in contact with the male for copulation to actually occur. So if he just has her in tandem and he transfers a sperm packet to a secondary um, sex apparatus and she doesn't form this thing that we call the wheel, there is no copulation. So she's essentially in control here. And what will happen is if it takes too long for her to cooperate, the male will let her go and, and go look for another date. Following a successful copulation comes egg laying. And in many species, to prevent other males from copulating the female, the male will guard the female while she lays eggs. And that's what's, doing, what's going on here. The male is still attached. The female has snaked her abdomen under this floating uh, leaf. And she's going to make a tiny little slit in the plant tissue and put one egg in that slit. Damselflies are all um, obligatory um, endophytic ovipositors. That is, they breed in plant stems or plant leaves of plant matter. In other species, like this uh, eastern amber wing, uh, the male does not stay attached, but he stays right near the female. And he drives off any male that attempts to copulate her because the way dragonflies and damselflies um, reproductive structures work is when a male copulates with a female, the first thing he does is try to remove or pack any sperm that she already has in her reproductive system from previous copulations, leaving his sperm in ascendancy, which means most of the eggs fertilized will be his. So there's a real premium in terms of fitness for males ensuring that no other males copulate with a female they've copulated with. So most of the eggs that are fertilized will be fertilized with their sperm. Are there exceptions where females are overpositing by themselves? Yeah, it happened uh, in some species more than others. Damselflies in particular, sometimes the male's uh, uh, job gets a little higher because the females will sometimes submerge along a plant stem and actually lay their egg well down the plant stem, dragging the male along with them. Sometimes the male will go along for the ride, sometimes he'll let go. So what happens to the eggs once they've been laid? 
Um, depends on the species. Some eggs will hatch almost instantly. Some eggs will go into a quiescent state. Some eggs will actually overwinter as eggs. But when the egg finally hatches, out of it comes a thing that we call a prolarva. And the prolarva has the shortest developmental st uh, interval of any of the stages of the larva because almost immediately after it gets out of the egg, it molds out of that form. And you can see that's going on right here. You can see the, the exoskeleton being left behind into the first larval stage. And from then, it's all about eating, growing, and not being eaten. So the cycle continues. What about Maine's Odonata fauna? Well, there are 471 known North American species, and Maine has over a third of them. That is remarkable. I have, by contrast, just listed some large land areas and the total number of odonate species they have. So we're talking about, you know, states that are twice as big, uh, Great Britain's, Britain's three times as big, Italy is eight times as big as Maine, and yet they don't have anywhere near the odonate fauna. And that has to do with the kind of unique transitional uh, uh, vegetation and water bodies that we have in the state and our rich, rich um, assemblage of um, you know, bogs and lakes and ponds and streams and fens and so forth that accounts for this really high uh, odonate fauna and diversity. So six families of dragonflies, three families of damselflies. Do we find new species? Yeah, we, we do. We've added uh, some new species just in the last couple of years. Um, one, the mocha emerald, uh, found by the eminent field bi biologist Mark Ward. And the banded pennant, found by a newbie who doesn't really know anything about damselflies and dragonflies and didn't really know that this was a new species for Maine. Okay, so, so there are new species that are, are cropping up and probably not because we hadn't found them before, more likely because they're moving north in their ranges. So let me just go through a quick overview of some of our representative species. The broadwings. These are these beautiful little metallic, usually greenish blue, uh, animals that we, we frequently find near streams or rivers with overhanging uh, foliage. They're very territorial. They're just gorgeous and they're very photogenic too. Go down there with your camera, you get some great pictures of these guys. This one is the most common when you're likely to see the ebony jewel wing. We've probably all seen these little guys. They come all bluets, right? Black and blue. Almost every pond and lake in Maine has them. And, and you've probably seen this one too, right? And where have you? As it turns out, there are lots of species of bluets, of these pond damsels. And the black and blue color pattern is the most common color pattern. I don't have them all represented here. So it's the, the most common color scheme you can see in this group. There are other color schemes. There are some that are violet. There are some that are red or orange or true yellow or a metallic -y green and blue. Okay, but, but the vast majority of these guys are black and blue of some color. The third family are what we call the spread wings, and you can see why. This animal's got its wings folded, but not folded over its abdomen. If I show you a damselfly, so you neatly fold it over the abdomen. These guys are kind of held at 45 degree angles, hence the term spread wing. Now, can damselflies do that sometimes? Sometimes they do, but normally not. Normally they fold their wings like this. And we've got a number of species of these guys as well. And these aren't all of them by any means. The dragonflies, six families, the darners, which most people are familiar with. These tend to be dark bodied insects with yellow and or green thoracic and abdominal markings. 
Many of them are very similarly colored, but often you can distinguish between species based on the nature of the markings on the thorax together with the ones on the abdomen. So you can see in this one, the thoracic stripe is interrupted, while in these it's continuous. This one has no markings in between its blue thoracic stripes. This one does have markings between its yellow blue thoracic stripes. Couple species, you hardly see any dark. Green and blue, the uh, common darner, and this magnificent animal green and brilliant orange red, the comet darner. The club tails, the gumphidae, so named because the at the end, the last few segments tend to be club shaped. If I show you a couple of these guys, you can see some of the clubs are really quite large, bounced. Again, reduced in these species. This particular guy, uh, the black-shouldered spiny leg, is almost surely the one that lands on your boat or your raft or your or your head when you go out in the boat or you're down near the water. They're very common, and and they, they frequently go for a ride in your kayak or your canoe. The emeralds, the cordulidae. Um, Generally, many species have these emerald green eyes. But that's what gives the family its common name. Not all species, but many species do. So you can see this species doesn't, but these do. Again, these tend to be dark dragonflies with um, often metallic um, color patches, particularly on the thorax. The spike tails only have three species. Uh, they're all dark bodies. They're all vivid yellow coloration. And they're very easy to tell apart in terms of species based on that color pattern on the abdomen. The cruisers, only two species of these in Maine. One of the very first one that emerges in Maine is uh, Didymops transversa. And this is a long-legged larva, and it will crawl some way out of the water to do its emerging off the side of your house even. And then finally, the last group is the biggest family. And these are the skips. And they come in a variety of colors and sizes. Uh, the white faces, a very small group, very active, out usually very early in the season, very common. Lots of pennants and skimmers of various colors and color patterns. Many of these are pretty easy to identify to species as adults, particularly the males. So if you get a dragonfly book and you take some pictures, you should be able to get these. One of our smaller ones, the uh, Eastern Amber Wing, Therathemus tenera. Our very smallest one, Nanothemus bella. This is a tiny, it's actually smaller than many damselflies. It's, it's really dramatic. Some of these guys are pretty similar. This is the slaty skimmer. This is the spangled skimmer. The real difference is based on the color of the pterostigma, white and black, just black here. But again, you can see this great distance away in determining the species. Again, some of these guys are pretty colorful. And some of them are pretty similar. So kind of the late summer, early fall, meadow hawks emerge, and many of those species are basically red. One species is black, we pretend to see it infrequently. So that's kind of an overview of the made fauna. I want to say just a word about rarity. The federal government uh, does listings of species based on whether they're threatened or endangered or special concern. And the state government does it too. The state has its own uh, Endangered Species Act. Um, the federal government listings always receive, but Maine can list things the federal government does not. And all states can do this. So this little critter is one I found. I found it in four locations and that's the only place it's ever been found. Okay. So from Maine standards, this is a rare bug only known from like five water bodies in Maine, probably introduced by a boater. 
But as it turns out, it's not a rare bug. It's found in almost every state east of the Mississippi, and this map doesn't show it, all down through Mexico and Central America into southern, um, northern South America. It's the most common species in its genus. So it's, it's really, really abundant. This little guy is the scarlet bluey. We did a study a couple of years ago, my students and I, and uh, tried to locate as many breeding locations in Maine for this species as we could, and we found a lot of them. So any of the reds or dark red are were, were breeding locations for that year. So very, very abundant. But this is the entire global range for this species. It's found no place else in the world except this area and most of the breeding locations for this globally rare bug are right here in Maine. So you always have to be careful when you use the term rare. Our own federally endangered species is this one, the ringed bog hunter. Uh, this is found in uh, PD bogs, uh, primarily in extreme southern Maine. We haven't found it anyplace else, and we've looked. So why do I think these groups are important? Why do we design a whole seven-year study, get all hundreds of people out, come to the state for these things? Well, the Odonata uh, have great ecological significance in terms of aquatic food webs. First of all, I've already pointed out, they're generalist predators. They eat lots of stuff. They eat worms, they eat insects, they eat small fish, they eat small uh, tadpoles, they eat small uh, and salamanders, they'll eat just about anything. They'll eat other odonates, actually. But they're also an important prey item. Lots of things eat them. Frogs eat them, fish eat them, uh, leeches may eat them, um, other odonates may eat them, other insects may eat them. So they're, they're really important in aquatic food webs, and their importance as a prey item, of course, is recognized by people who fly fish. So there are lots of lures that are designed, like either the adult or the larval odonate, to try and get fish. But equally important, these guys are generalist predators in the terrestrial ecosystem. And they eat all sorts of things, right? They're also really important prey items. And they probably have been important prey items for millions of years. I particularly like this representation by the American Museum of Natural History showing what was a pterosaur pursuing a dragonfly. So clearly contemporary birds do it, probably flying reptiles did as well. But equally important in terms of their ecological function is their role as biological indicators. Because odonates can be good, reliable indicators of habitat integrity of freshwater systems, in part because of their role in the food webs, but also because of their reliance on nearshore aquatic plants, both the submerged plants and emergent plants, which they use for egg laying, they use for larval habitat, that's where most of the larvae live, and in some species that's the emergence habitat. They, they crawl up on pipeweed and, and excuse me, pipe wart and and, and uh, arrow leaf and things like that. But also important is the reliance of this group on shoreline terrestrial vegetation. In terms of feeding, that's where they, they forage. That's where they roost at night. That's where they shelter out of the wind or out of the sun or uh, out of the rain. So, so having a rich odonate fauna says something about the plants at that particular site as well. And then some species are just actual water contaminants. You don't find them in places where certain kinds of So I often think of very rich um, odonate habitat as looking like this. Some places has got lots of shoreline vegetation, but lots of aquatic vegetation, both emergent and submerged, right? So any of those are, are rich and, and they, they vary in terms of the assemblages associated with them based on the plants that are there. 
So major conservation concerns for this group, um, well, shoreline habitat disturbance, loss of near shore aquatic vegetation, because nobody wants it in their swimming area, um, but also loss of shoreline vegetation. I'm not talking about aquatic plants, I'm talking about terrestrial plants at the shoreline. Public access and water quality. We in Maine are quite lucky in that many of our lakes and ponds are not well developed. Go next door to Vermont or New Hampshire and it's a very different scene where much of the vegetation around many of the ponds has been eliminated, much of the aquatic vegetation has been eliminated and it's very poor um, odinate habitat as a result. Pesticides, and here I'm talking primarily about pesticides applied on land that then run off the water. Climate change, climate change is affecting all sorts of uh, organisms on the planet right now and odates are no exception. And of course, introduced species. Whether the species are introduced accidentally, whether the species uh, are introduced through change exchanges, or whether the species are introduced purposely as in the case of using dragonflies from out of state to control mosquitoes in some townships. First of all, let me point out, there's no evidence that actually worked. People can say whatever they like, but there's no data to support it. But I have an asterisk there because if you put a bunch of, studies have shown, if you put a bunch of mosquito larvae in big barrels and introduce dragonfly larvae in some of them, yeah, they'll eat them. And control the amount of larvae, but there's no evidence this works in the wild. Moreover, introducing more dragonflies into our has dragonflies may alter the predator-prey ratio to the detriment of all of the dragonflies. And remember, you want those same dragonflies to actually breed and be there next year too, right? Introducing dragonflies, um, from who knows out of the range, maybe new species may actually be introducing competitors for native species that they're not able to compete effectively with. So it may actually be harming the native odinate fauna with these kinds of introductions. But highest on my list is the fact that dragonflies eat anything. We think of them as mosquito hawks or deer fly hawks. Oh, please. The number of times I've seen them eat mosquitoes or deer flies uh, is pretty pretty slim compared to all the things I've seen them eat. Okay, those are all native pollinators that are all being consumed by dragonflies. They will eat anything that flies that they think they can catch. Okay, including other dragonflies. There are even records of large dragonflies going after honey. Okay, so they don't specialize. They're a generalist predator. They eat anything and everything, not just mosquitoes, not just deer flies and horse flies. Well, and finally, I should point out this is not legal without a uh, permit from IFW. All right. Lastly, I just always get asked about good sources for identification. So I maintain this website. Just go main damselflies and dragonflies. It'll come up. The pull down menu will get our list of species, toggle any one. It will take all sorts of pictures of, of um, our state's fauna, and I update this frequently. I've been asked about guides. Um, those are the top ones I would recommend. If I was only going to own one book on dragonflies, it would be Dennis Paulson's book, All the Damselflies and Dragonflies East of Mississippi. He's got one for the West, too. If I was going to own just one book, Damselflies, it would be Ed Lamb's. It's a terrific book, specializes on the Northeast. If I was going to order three books, any one of these is good. Blair Nicholas, many of the pictures you saw were his. Uh, many of the dragonflies in Massachusetts we have as well. This one for Algonquin National Park, it's about two thirds of our dragonflies, really well done, really well laid out. And then Sid Dunkel has this uh, dragonflies through binoculars, all of them for North America. So any of them are good. Free phone app for Android or iOS. You can go online, find it, download it. It's got pictures of everything. Um, I carry one on my phone, uh, real easy. If you're not familiar with iNaturalist, I would suggest that you uh, 
set up an account and go on it. You can do explore. I just put in Odonata here and Maine, and you can see all of the species that have been reported in Maine. Um, I think uh, from 1,200 observers, nearly 8,000 reports since uh, iNaturalist started uh, uh, taking reports, which was about 2011. And about 146 of our 161 species have been reported. But what you can do is you can quickly see kind of an overview of what these guys look like and say, oh yeah, mine looks like this one, okay? Uh, just let me quickly thank my collaborators, uh, Philip Demet, Demet Adier, who is uh, uh, an IFW uh, biologist, uh, the late Paul Brunel, uh, Herb Wilson from Colby, and I have worked together for many years, uh, Mark Ward, eminent uh, field biologist, and lots and lots and lots of UMF students who have worked with me over the years. And so I can see we're just time. And I would be happy to field any questions people might have. Thank you. Really, uh, really informative. Learned a lot. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, the uh, the person asking the question, can you hear me, Ron? I can hear you. I can't hear the person asking the question. Can hear me. I didn't know if I needed to, to speak into the. No, I, I I can hear you. I can hear you fine. He lives on a lake, and has noticed since the first year they live there that he finds exoskeletons on cement, um, on the wall of the house, on kayaks and all sorts of places that don't seem like dragonflies would be attaching them or the, they would be attaching themselves at that last stage. And what do you think about that? That's really, really very common. Remember the dragonfly larva in that final instar is trying to get out of the water. It's going to be very vulnerable. And so the farther it can get from the water and the higher up it can get um, off the ground, the better its chances of survival. Uh, because once it emerges, it's really, really fragile. I mean, you, you can't even touch them or their wings won't uh, open normally. So yeah, I, I used to have a house uh, right next to the lake, about 15 feet away. And when Didymops transversely would emerge, I would have 40 or 50 of these all over my house, uh, which was fun because, uh, you know, the house was basically an emergent site for them. So th they'll use any any uh, vertical surface, it doesn't really matter to them because they're not going to stay there. They're just going to emerge there and then leave. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. question is about dragonflies getting to Tahiti and whether this goes way back. Did they come by ship? Um, were they there before the islands separated out? That's, that's a good question. Um, so um, part of the answer is probably there before uh, in, in some areas of the world. Because remember, um, dragonflies have been around for 300 million years the face of the planet looked a very different 300 million years ago, right? Uh, and, and it slowly changed as continents have moved. So where you find dragonflies now may be related to where dragonflies were before. In the case of volcanic islands, it's different. Um, in those cases, the animals are either migrants, like uh, Pantella flabescens, the wandering glider, they're windblown, 
or they end up rafting on as probably a larval forms in wet stuff uh, that floats around the marine environment. So um, in, in the volcanic islands, these guys are all introduced in, in, one, in one way or another. Other questions? Another question, Ron. What are the wings made out of that look, you know, almost completely transparent? Yeah, so the the the, the wing material itself is uh, 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 a combination of things: chitin, the same the same stuff really that the exoskeleton is made out of. It's just very thin by contrast. Um, and in that wing are veins in which what passes for blood in insects is actually circulating, right? So those, those veins are actually all actual structural veins, but they're also transport uh, um, vessels as well. So, so primarily um, chitin is, 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 the, is the structural component. That's what holds them stiffly. Right. Like, once once they dry, once they dry, they're very very stiff. And dragonflies are pretty tough. I mean, if you net one, I mean, I sometimes say now you you can take their wings together and general you know extract them, look at them, take pictures of them, and set them down, and they'll straighten their wings back out and take off. And the same with with damselflies. They're 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 unlike butterflies. They don't. They're not really harmed by handling them. Any other questions from anyone? No? Looks like we're good. Thank you. For a wonderful You're welcome. A lot of Thanks, for, Thanks for having me. A lot of clapping from the audience. Okay. Good night. Good night, all.